Dan Aykroyd was born on July 1st, 1952, to Canadian parents in Ottawa, Ontario. Throughout his life, he was always intrigued by how people walked, especially ones committing crime. He decided to study sociology and uh, criminology. Well, that was until he started in the Canadian nightclub scene, walking as a blues man and a comedian, while actually making money at an after hour speakeasy called Club 505 in Toronto. He made the right connections in his time, walking with comedy writer Lorne Michaels on the Halt and Lorne Terrific Owl when he was only 17, which paved the way for him to appear on a new and unusual show on NBC Late Night, Saturday Night Live. Jane, you ignorant slut. <laughs> of course, Dan Aykroyd is a person that most people are familiar with, as he was part of the original cast of SNL, created the sketch, movies, and band of the Blues Brothers, and wrote installed in the 1984 film Ghostbusters. But he's a man of many talents, and creating successful businesses is one of them. He helped found the House of Blues chain, owns part of several Canadian wineries, maintains exclusive distribution rights to Patron Tequila in Canada. Oh, and yeah, created one of the full celebrity owned spirits brands, Crystal Skull Vodka. Now, what's inside this bottle's not special. This one's empty, but generally it's just a four times distilled, seven times filtered neutral grain spirit that's blended with Newfoundland Waddle. Comes out at 80 proof, 40% ABV, and is kind of a seriously cool looking bottle. They have about a 40% defect rate in manufacturing, but hey, this looks so amazing on your shelf especially around Halloween. But vodka, the spirit house inside, has a lot more of an interesting history than Dana Aykroyd created me. One that involves two countries trying to claim it as their own, Russia and Poland. Now, the origin of vodka is highly contested, to say the least, and the early days are oh, really not well documented. Some believe vodka showed up in the 8th century in Poland, some say the 9th century of Russia. What we can't say for Solon is that the Folsha Stiller was founded in 1174 in a small Russian town called Kilsnosk. Probably butcher that, I'm sorry, I don't speak Russian. And now, to bounce with that too, the history of alcohol distillation is also a little muddy. The 12th century is pretty much when we see the full still for alcohol distillation which produced a product with a lot higher proof than what was being made before that. But before that, one of the methods used, especially in cold regions such as Poland and Russia, is what we call freeze distillation or fractional freezing, which pretty much uses the cold climate to raise the ABV of a liquid, specifically beer or wine. Now, since Waddle freezes before alcohol, what they do is they leave it outside, take away the whatever freezes, and keep kind of distilling it down into more of a spirit, something that's going to be a higher ABV. Now Russia, like I was saying, seemed to use beer as a base, while Poland seemed to use wine. Both of which aren't really what we know today as vodka. Now once the false vodka distillery and the, the still showed up in the 12th century, it basically created a more consistent and higher ABV spirit than before. Freeze distillation only got you from around like 25 to 35% ABV, while proper distillation can get you to 40% or oval. But this is also the time that they're not looking at these distilled spirits as something as necessarily a way to get you drunk. They'll use more in these medicinal ways. But among the walking class, especially because making a spirit like this was rather cheap, it became very big and soon people were using it for kind of these personal reasons beyond the health. In 1716 Russia, Zal Peel the Great sold to regulate the ownership of vodka distilleries, promoting state manufactured vodka as it's quickly becoming one of the biggest profit centers for the government, at times providing up to 40% of the state revenue. Now Poland at this time is experimenting with different bases for its spirits, including rye, carrot, grass, and more. Some Polish distilleries from this time are still around, such as Zabruka, which is kind of known today as the bison grass vodka. That specific distillery stalled around sometime in the 16th century. Now Poland began to export it and bring it to other areas of Europe in about the 18th century. Now the next couple years saw a lot of innovation, specifically by the Russians, to make vodka more what we're used to it today. In 1780, Theodore Lautz was commissioned by Peel the Great to make the national drink, which was a version of today's vodka, more hygienic. And this is where we begin to see filtering it, specifically through charcoal, which helped remove contaminants and produced a cleaner spirit and stripped away from the color. In 18th early, away from Russian Poland in Ireland, Anise Cafe built the coffee still, which allowed continuous distillation and allowed for a high level of purity and consistency. In 1894, Saul Alexander III commissioned the cradle of the periodic table of elements, Dmitry Mendelev, through such ways to improve the quality of vodka. 
He discovered that 40% was the ideal strength of vodka, which was then adopted as the official standard for Russian vodka by the government in 1896. And vodka was one of the areas that really any Russian could make a lot of money. Peter Smirnov was born into a small Russian village in 1831 and started a vodka to in 1864. But the rise of the Bolsheviks in the early 1900s in Russia put a stop to that. They confiscated and nationalized all private businesses including distilleries. Now, Smirnov was lucky enough to flee the country and moved around Europe, landing in Poland, before settling in France and adopting an Anglicized family name, Smirnov. His son then relaunched the brand, which has dwarfed into one of the biggest spirit companies today. Now, Russia had its own prohibition from 1914 to 1925, and America followed shortly from 1919 to 1933. Many Russians fled the country during the Russian Revolution, with wealthy Russians living in Paris and in London, bringing their beloved spirit with them. These prohibitions also drove bartenders into Europe where new cocktails would be invented, such as the Bloody Mary. With American prohibition being officially over by 1934, bartenders reached home with knowledge of this new spirit and some new cocktails. And John G. Mullen, the president of Hublin, Inc., which sold several premixed cocktails and even A1 steak sauce, bought the rights to the Smirnoff brand, feeling like, hey, vodka might be a big thing. John G. Mullen just wasn't successful. At least not right away. A small bar on the Sunset Strip got the right cut small in 1941. John G. Mullen was trying to promote his new spirit that Americans really seemed uninterested in. The owner, Jack Morgan, also was troubled as he was having issues selling his own business venture. Gingerbeal. Unbeknownst to them, and they'll quabbling about the problems, a recent Russian immigrant by the name of Sophie Brensky was also bullied. But instead of with these drinks, she had a vessel. She had brought with all 2,000 physical copper mugs with them that her family had manufactured in Russia at their copper factory. The right three people met there at the same time, and the Moscow Mule was made with a very special image with the copper mug, and it became the cocktail of this bar, the Cock and Bull. Now, Smirnov launched a successful ad campaign a few years later with the Moscow Mule, and then other cocktails, too, such as Bloody Mary, Screwdriver, Bullshot, and the Ice Pick. And with World War II being over, celebrating was needed, especially with a cocktail in your hand. And what looked better? Then a Moscow Mule and a Koppel Mug. Building on the success, James Bond ordered a Vespa Maltini in 1953 when Casino Royale was published, which popularized shaking the spirit due to its very neutral profile, making it easier to drink when it's really cold, nearly frozen. Absolute Vodka came on the scene in 1979, which used Russian and Polish tradition that was refined using some Swedish techniques. Kella One was launched in 1983 using a copper pill to redistill the vodka, and the Espresso Maltini was created that same year. A few years later, Dale DeGroff sold the Cosmopolitan cocktail in 1987 at the Rainbow Room, using a citron-flavored vodka. Madonna was seen drinking one, which exploded the popularity of the drink and the spirit overnight, which you can now see prominently in other things, such as Sex and the City. The late 90s took away the association of vodka with Russia and Poland with the launch of Tito's Vodka in 1997, coming out of Austin, Texas, the launch of Grey Goose out of France. And we're kind of continuing that trend today. With the Russo-Ukrainian wool, many local souls and balls are actually refusing to hold Russian vodkas and Russian spirits. And I can even say that my local local soul has a whole section dedicated to Ukrainian wine and spirits. And coming from my experience walking up balls, Russian vodka is something that we don't really sell. It's really just about Tito's Absolute or Grey Goose. Now, other companies are trying to innovate in the sector, such as this guy. This distillery out of Alameda, California, St. George, which uses pear within its mash bill to create something unique. Let's give it a try. Not a big fan of drinking vodka straight, but this one's pretty good. It's interesting. So you definitely get, it smells like a neutral grain spirit. You get a little bit of ethanol, but you also get this sweet honey, bit of honey from it too. Like a lot of vodka, the mouth feels kind of soft. This has a little bit of an oily nature to it, but it's neutral. You really don't taste much. The nice thing about St. George is you also don't get too much of an ethanol bone. You definitely smell more on the nose than what you're going to taste. But yeah, there is a nice little sweetness to it. Well, even recently, MGP, a contract distiller for whiskey and neutral grain spirits, so it's actually going to be closing its neutral grain distillery by t January 2024 to focus on whiskey. The future of vodka, though, is still growing, especially with the rise of canned cocktails, especially the success of high noon seltzers, which are made with real vodka, when compared to White Claws, which are just a malt beverage. Now, White Claw has even released our own vodka label and vodka-based seltzer 
this year and only 2023. But this is kind of, the history is kind of cool and it's convoluted. And vodka today is different than what it was in Russia and Poland hundreds and thousands of years ago. What exactly defines vodka? I'm going off of the American TTB description, which defines vodka as a spirit distilled from any material at or below 95% ABV and bottled at no less than 40% ABV. It is either neutral from distillation or through filtering with charcoal or other materials to be without a distinctive character, aroma, taste, or color. So you look at something like this, very clearly, no color, minimal taste, it's more just a base to drink alcohol. Now there's also flavored vodkas, which need to be flavored with natural flavoring materials, which can be with or without sugar, but not bottled at less than 30% ABV. And the flavoring needs to be prominent on the packaging. For example, also by St. George, we have the California Citrus Vodka, which very clearly here says orange flavored vodka. And this is made in the Golden State out of a few different types of oranges. Now Citron is kind of a popular version. You look at the Cosmopolitan, which should be made with a Citron, a citrus flavored vodka. Grey Goose, Absolute, there's all these different versions. So let's give this a try. It's very perfumey. It's crazy. It tastes, it doesn't taste like orange juice. It tastes like orange peel. So you get a little, I don't want to say the bitterness, but like the oiliness of the orange peel, like when you smell it. It tastes like you're smelling an orange. But the one we've looked at here, being distilled from oranges and pears, I also have a pink Whitney, which is flavored with pink lemonade. There's plenty of different ways to make vodka. We touched a little bit on bison grass, which is vodka distilled from literally grass. But there can be many different bases, most commonly being potatoes or grains. Uh, let's begin with some of the grains. Corn, such as what's in Tito's, tends to be sweet with a velvety texture and notes of butter and vanilla. Wheat, like Absolute, all crisp with a lighter mouthfeel. And then rye, such as Belvedere, is reminiscent of wheat vodkas with a little bit of a peppery note. Blended vodkas, like Grey Goose, can vary from being incredibly neutral to incredibly unique. And then when we look at something like potato vodka, such as with Chopin, also have this creamy texture with more of an earthy flavor. Now, there's a lot of little bases that are super unique, such as rice and the Centauri Haku vodka, grapes for Surak vodka, apples for Cleo Creek vodka, and whey, you know, from uh, cheese in Black Cow vodka. How do you like to drink your vodka? Probably not like this in a Glencairn, probably in a drink, and I'd love to hear about any fun history that you know with vodka. Drop them down below, tell me your favorite cocktail. I'm Zachary, and cheers. Oh, it's still vodka, though. Ugh.